Hello, James Duffy here again to share some tips, techniques, and thoughts, this time focused on finishing. Based on some of the feedback from my previous presentations, I've been asked to dig into the arcane dark arts of preparing, masking, and painting rockets. We'll even touch on the application of cut vinyl markings in a bit. We might consider this presentation an extension of the session I offered at Narcon two years ago, where I featured scale modeling techniques that could be used on sport models. This is one of the rockets that I featured in that presentation, a significantly altered Estes Alpha. It is my humble opinion that the Estes Der Big Red Max kit is the greatest starting point for kit bashing, scratch building, modification, cloning, whatever that the company has ever released. Think of the Big Red Max as a really cool set of parts. I immediately seized upon the potential in this simple kit, although I freely admit that a rogue Amazon pricing algorithm may have played a role in the number of these projects that I've completed. It's really hard to say no to a $20 Screamer deal with free shipping. I've bashed Big Red Maxes into things as unusual as this two-stage C-47 inspired D-Day rocket which shares markings with an actual C-47 veteran aircraft that's hangered near my home here in Texas. The second stage is a downscaled Max built from a Goblin kit. The markings came from Cali Graphics, a cut vinyl vendor that specializes in the RC aircraft market. Here's our C-47 Max in flight. Now there might be some questions about how the staging is done here, so expect a video on that very subject in the near future. The aircraft-inspired theme continues with much of my Big Red Max fleet, including this P-51, which also has the D-Day black and white invasion stripes on it. Here's our P-51 Max in flight. Here's an Israeli F-16-inspired Max. And here's a Texas Air National Guard F-16 Max with an interwar heritage scheme. Again, the markings on all of these came from Cali Graphics. I've also had a couple of Big Red Max-based clones cross my workbench lately. This is an upscaled Citation Patriot, won't even fit under the camera. And my good friend Mike Nowak assisted by laser cutting the plywood fin cores used for this project. Here's the Citation Patriot in flight. The onboard cameras are just the tiny little pill-shaped units that Estes ships with the current AstroCam attached to the rocket with gaffer tape. Mike also cut the fin cores for this 226% Estes Bandit upscale project again based on a Big Red Max. You can purchase the fin cores for either of these projects from his Galactic Manufacturing website. The cut vinyl markings for both of these projects came from Mark Hayes at Sticker Shot 23. He does great work and he's a rocket guy himself. All of these completed projects have used the same basic approach for painting and finishing. We'll start by priming the airframes with a high build automotive primer. After the primer cures, we'll sand it with a progression of sanding papers. Over the primed and sanded base, we'll shoot some more primer specific to the color coats we'll be using and then sand again with very fine grit sanding film. Our color coats will go over that, carefully considering the sequence of colors and masking. Next, we can even add some detail colors using acrylic paints applied with an airbrush. Finally, we'll bring everything together by applying some cut vinyl markings. So, what should we build? After this run of aircraft-inspired models, I asked for suggestions on one of the rocket forums. Mark Bundick kindly suggested something British. So, one of these projects will be a World War II Spitfire homage. We're also going to bash another kit into a 307% upscaled Estes Alpha 
featuring a classic auto racing livery. I've selected a Spitfire flown by squadron leader John Plogis, who was a Greek Rhodesian pilot in the D-Day period, and it features these great looking invasion stripes. Note how they only go halfway up the side of the fuselage. There's also a really neat yellow leading edge detail right over here that we're going to duplicate as well. There's also a neat little detail right here, this contrasting element of color right here. Our first step will be to prime the model. As I noted earlier, I like to use the Rust-Oleum Gray Automotive Primer for just about anything. It's a relatively quick drying primer and it's readily available at Home Depot. Now there are some of those out there who prefer to use a white primer as an undercoat for lighter colors and they're not wrong. This may be a case where my comfort with a particular product overrides any common sense. The primer is applied in my state-of-the-art paint booth, which also doubles as my wife's horse trailer. The important thing here is to get out of the wind, and since we're using a solvent-based primer, I should be wearing a mask. I'm not. I like to use a microphone stand as a holder for larger models. You can pick one up new for about 30 bucks, or much less if you scrounge a used one somewhere. The primer is applied in long strokes. The important thing is to start off the model and finish off the model. Maintain a constant distance from the surface of the model. For primer, I like to be about 10 to 12 inches away. We'll do multiple light layers, allowing about seven to 10 minutes between each coat. Four light coats should do fine for this first pass. We'll allow everything to dry for at least 24 hours and longer if you're in a high humidity area. Okay, the primer has had an opportunity to cure on one of our Red Max kits, and we're going to sand down the primer. Now, fair warning, this is something you do outside. I'm going to do just a small bit of this here in my studio because it is going to produce a great deal of sanding dust. Now, what I'd like you to notice here, I'm using 400 grit sandpaper, as I sand, the color of the finish will actually change. All you want to do is change that color a little bit. See how that color changes? It really is quite pronounced. It also produces a great deal of sanding dust. So we're going to stop here. I'm going to move outside, finish it up, and come back in a moment. Okay, we are back inside after having sanded most of the primer off of the airframe. There's still a few spots we need to get. These little crevices here where we put our glue fillets need to be sanded down. I've also wiped down most of the airframe with a damp paper towel. Now at this point what I like to do is take another piece of paper, this again is 400 grit paper, and gently curl it and work these joints here, these little crotches between the fins and the airframe. I know that's an inelegant term, but it works. And you know exactly what I'm talking about. It just takes a few minutes. Again, we're looking for the color to change. Now you can do this prime and sand cycle as many times as you want. If I were doing a scale model, I would do it until the seams in the airframe were invisible. For a sport rocket though, two cycles is more than adequate for me. After I finish sanding this out, we'll move on to our next step. We have finished sanding the primed airframe and our next step will be to use a tack cloth. A tack cloth is a wax impregnated bit of cheesecloth that's used to remove any excess dust from the model. You can get these at Home Depot or Lowe's or any other type of home goods store. Very simple to use, just drag them over the surface of the model to pick up any stray dust. We're going to spray over this with some more primer. This is a color specific primer that will go over the base primer. This may be considered an unnecessary step, but I like to do it because I'm now matching the surface of the airframe to the paint that's going to go over it. 
A single coat of this is more than adequate. We are back in my state-of-the-art paint booth, this time with a mask on. The Tamiya primer is applied just like the auto body primer with long strokes that start and end off of the surface of the model. There's no need to put an opaque coat of this stuff on the model. Just a couple of light coats are all we need. Now this primer dries much faster than the auto body primer and we'll be ready to sand it out in just a few hours. Our Tamiya primer has cured and we're going to sand the whole model down with 1500 grit sandpaper. Now this is not something you typically find at Home Depot or Lowe's, but it is still pretty easy to find. You can either go to an automotive paint supply store or it's routinely available on Amazon. On a complex paint scheme like our Spitfire, it pays off to thoroughly plan the order in which each color will be applied. In general, we're going to go from the lightest color to the darkest, we're going to go from the bottom of the paint scheme to the top, and the most durable paint to the most delicate. Now that last one may seem a bit unusual, but it's worth noting that the lacquers that we'll be using are pretty much bulletproof, while the airbrushed acrylics can be scratched, at least until we get a clear protective coat over everything. The first color we apply will be the white base for the invasion stripes. These will be on the upper and lower surfaces of the wings, which in this case are these two fins. We'll also apply white to the belly area between the two fin slash wings for the invasion stripes there. Now more white will also go onto the leading edges of the wings as a base for the yellow details. We'll be using Tamiya TS26 Pure White Spray Lacquer for this step. We're going to apply our color coats using exactly the same process we used as the primer. We'll start the spray off the model and finish off the model. It's probably going to require four or five coats of white paint to get adequate coverage. We're going to wait about seven to ten minutes between each coat. Our white paint has had an opportunity to cure overnight and we can start masking for the light gray belly color. Now each of the individual invasion stripes on the wings and belly will be 10 millimeters wide, so we need to protect an area about 50 millimeters wide on each of those surfaces. Why 10 millimeters? Because we have tape that's already 10 millimeters wide, and that's an easy way to do this by having the tape itself do all of the tricky measurement and alignment work. On the wings, our stripes will start 18 millimeters, or about three quarters of an inch, away from the fin root. We'll be using a strip of general use masking tape to locate the first stripe. This is 3M type 233 tape. Think of it as a quality alternative to standard blue tape. I'll stick it on the cutting mat and peel it up a couple of times. The goal here is to reduce the stickiness of the tape. We'll put it right up against the fin root. And there, that will help us align our first stripe. With our alignment strip in place, we can next apply five pieces of 10 millimeter tape along this line. Here we're going to use Tamiya tape, which is the best masking tape ever, in my humble opinion. It's a little bit on the expensive side, but it is worth it. Each subsequent piece of tape is applied right up against the edge of the previous strip. That makes our alignment perfect. We can now pull up our alignment strip. We can use this again. And the two intermediate strips, these are the locations where black paint will be applied. Okay. 
We'll move on to our belly stripes now. I want the 50 millimeter band right in this area. To line that up, I've used a strip of 40 millimeter tape and a strip of 18 millimeter tape. Okay, all of the basic stripes are in place. Our next step will be to clean up these edges right here just a little bit, and then we'll put some overspray masks in place. We could go ahead and spray the black acrylic at this point. I'm going to wait on that though. Recall what I said earlier about acrylic paint being delicate. Another alternative would be to shoot the black stripes with spray lacquer, but that would rob us of the opportunity to demonstrate the airbrush. Instead, we're going to put some overspray masks in place, and then we're going to paint the gray underside, the belly of the rocket. We have our rocket vertical on the bench now. Next, the leading edges of the wings will be covered with carefully placed strips of 10 millimeter Tamiya tape. This will protect the white undercoating for the yellow leading edge details that we'll paint later. Now, now some may ask why we're doing this, and the reason is, is that the white undercoat will help the yellow color pop or be more vibrant. Let's place some overspray masks over the areas we just masked. This is easy to do with strips of plastic cut from old shopping bags. Now resist the urge to use paper here as the solvents in lacquers like to migrate through the fiber in paper. Ask me how I know sometime. Inexpensive standard masking tape is fine to attach the overspray masks to the expensive Tamiya stuff. On the belly, we're going to approach things a little bit differently. We're simply going to use strips of 18 millimeter tape placed very carefully over the existing stripe masks. Now, when the time comes to pull this up, we need to be very careful in how we remove this so that we don't disturb the underlying mask. With these masks in place, we're ready to spray the belly of our Spitfire. We'll be using a light gray Tamiya spray lacquer for this step. The question then becomes, what gray? And then you put something like a Euro gray over it. Oh. Euro gray. Oh my God, there's like 14 different grays. It's, it's, it's crazy. Here are the gray Tamiya lacquers that I have on my shelf right now. There are more still sleeping quietly in the racks at the hobby shop, but we should be able to find something that works here. Looking at this image of the Spitfire we're emulating, the underside is a light to medium gray, while the gray in the upper camouflage pattern definitely has a blue vibe going on. Here are the lacquers I've chosen. For the underside, we're going to go with this light ghost gray. The top surface will eventually get this intermediate blue, which seems just about perfect. We are back in the paint booth to apply the light ghost gray belly coat. Three or four light coats here should do the trick, allowing about seven minutes between each coat. The light gray belly paint has had a good 24 hours to cure, and it's now time to mask this off to protect it so that we can paint the blue gray upper surfaces. We're going to be using Tamiya tape for this. This is the 18 millimeter tape, and it's going to be used for the bulk of the masking tasks here. We'll be using an unexpected tool to help us here. This is the good old Estes tube marking guide, and it's great for defining straight lines along tubular structures. In this case, we'll be using it to make sure that the, the masking tape gets applied in a very straight line along the surface of the airframe tube. We're going to start by applying 18 millimeter tape to the perimeter of the lower fin surfaces.
The undersides of the fins have been masked off. Now we can apply the longitudinal masking. With that, the peripheral masking is done. The next thing we'll do is go ahead and cover all of the gray underside with plastic bag overspray masks. Something I should make clear here, whenever the tape touches the actual surface of the model, I'm using the good yellow Tamiya tape. Whenever I'm attaching an overspray mask to tape that's already there, I'm using the inexpensive green tape. We've completed a fairly complex mask job. Now, admittedly, I've done similar things before. That took me about 20 to 25 minutes. The key is to think about what you're doing ahead, plan ahead, and then execute on that plan. Note that none of the previous masking materials we put in place have come up off the model yet. Those are going to come off of the model in a logical sequence as we move forward. I'll check all of the edges one more time just to make sure that they're down and in place securely, and then we'll be ready to paint the upper surface of our model. We are back in our improvised paint booth to spray the intermediate blue color on the top surfaces. As before, we're doing long strokes that begin off the model and end off of the model. Our blue top coat is cured overnight, and there are a couple of ways we can go at this point. The easiest path might be to freehand the green camo pattern with an airbrush. That would look fine, but the Spitfire we're emulating had very sharp camo pattern borders. Another way to do that would be to cut the pattern with a sharp blade onto wide masking tape and use spray lacquer to apply the green. Now this is a 40 millimeter wide tape, very similar to the Tamiya tape. As a matter of fact, I think it's even sold by Tamiya, but it is stiffer and has more adhesive on it. A quick look at the Spitfire photos will give us some ideas for cutting the tape. Note the sharp edge lines on the borders between the blue and the green. We want to cut the tape into wide, irregular waves. Before we start slicing, I'm going to stick and remove the tape onto the cutting mat a couple of times. That will reduce the stickiness of the tape and lower the chance that we damage the underlying paint surface. With the wide tape down on the cutting mat, we can use a fresh blade to cut an irregular pattern into the tape. That will give us two strips of tape that we can ultimately use to put on the model. Note that none of the masking materials have been removed yet. We're simply stacking more and more masking layers on top. The tape is applied at roughly a 45 degree angle to the long axis of the rocket. And I'd like to do three wide bands to match the photos. We'll also need to add more camo areas to the wings. There's really no wrong way to do this. Just have fun and be creative. The first stage in this masking process is now done. What I'll do now is go back and fill in these intermediate areas with the 18 millimeter Tamiya tape. Since this is going to be directly on a painted surface of the model, we'll use the good stuff. Our camouflage masking is in place. Now here's a really important tip. Make sure you go through and burnish down every one of these tape lines. 
This is the greatest opportunity for leak through that we've got in this entire project. So I'm going to take a few minutes off camera to re reburnish these lines and then we'll be ready to paint. The lacquer we're using here is to me is Olive Drab 2 spray. Now it differs from the Olive Drab 1 lacquer in that it has a slightly more worn and weathered appearance that I like. We'll put four light coats on the model. Emphasis on light, we don't want the paint migrating underneath the tape that we've laid down. Our green paint has had an opportunity to settle down for a few hours, so we can start working on removing some of this masking material. Now remember, the overspray masks for the white fields we put on at the very beginning of the masking process, we need to leave in place. So we need to remove everything very carefully. Let's get started. I'll be using a pair of tweezers for this step. Most of the masking has been removed at this point. The next step will be to very carefully remove the overspray masks we put in place to protect the invasion stripe areas. This is critically important. So take your time and think through everything before you remove it. There we go. Our next step will be to put some overspray masks in place and paint the invasion stripes black. It's time to paint the invasion stripes on our model and we're going to be using Tamiya XF69 NATO black acrylic paint to do that. That will be thinned out with the appropriate thinner for that paint. Now we will be using a Pache SI single action airbrush. Now this tutorial is not designed to be an introduction to airbrushing. There are plenty of other alternate uh, guides to airbrushing out there on the web. I encourage you to go find them. In some of my earlier videos, I've even touched on the basics. We'll start by putting some thinner in the color cup. This is an inexpensive little pipette, lab pipette. You can buy a box of 100 on these on Amazon for $10 or less. Now I'm adding paint to the brush using the same pipette. I'll use the pipette also to mix it. I'll draw the paint back up into the pipette a few times and squeeze it out into the color cup. Now when you do this, don't do it over your model like I'm doing right now. It's a very dumb thing to do. I often do dumb things. Our airbrush compressor is running. I'll adjust the flow of the paint here on this paper. Looks good. Let's go to work. This is where our model is really going to start to pop. And there we go. There's our first invasion stripe. I'll do the next two off camera. I'd like to point out that this wasn't difficult at all. It was a little time consuming, I'll admit, but it certainly wasn't hard. It just took a little planning and a little bit of patience. This is well within the skill set of most model builders. Remember these white leading edges that we masked off some time ago? Well, we're going to remask them and paint them yellow.
Remember this little detail? It's now time to mask and paint that. Conveniently, that little detail is also the same color as the spinner on the aircraft. So we'll paint our nose cone the same color as that. I've cut a piece of index card that we're going to use as a template to line up the mask area for that aft detail. I'll put tape right here. The leading edge of this will be 40 millimeters ahead of our template. Again, we're going to use the tape to help us measure everything out. The last little bit of paint has been applied to our model. Let's unmask it and see what it looks like. Okay. All of the masking materials are off the rocket. Next up, we apply the cut vinyl markings. We'll be using what's called cut vinyl. It's a great alternative to water transfer decals that's especially well suited to large models. Now, what are cut vinyl markings? If you go down the road from your home, you will probably see all kinds of commercial signs that have been produced using this process. There is a large format printer that can both print graphics and then cut around those graphics onto a vinyl surface. That's a self-adhesive vinyl surface. After that's printed out, a second transfer layer is placed on top of those graphics. We can cut each graphic out individually, remove the original backing sheet exposing the adhesive, position it on our model, and then remove the transfer sheet. It may sound complicated at first, but it's actually quite simple. Now let's talk about the graphics we're going to be using here. We have six roundels. Now the roundel is the national emblem that can be found on any military aircraft. These two large ones will go on the tops of the wings. These without the yellow ring will go on the bottom of the wings. These two with the yellow rings around them will go on the sides of the fuselage. Next, the squadron markings will go ahead and behind of the markings on the side of the fuselage. We also have something called fin flashes. These will go on the vertical tail of the aircraft. And this is an aircraft letter that will also go on the tail. We've also got the serial number of the aircraft, some nose art. He probably had a girlfriend named Kay. And then we have other goodies like, let's see, we've got, these are markings for the propeller, and these are probably some data plates that we can put anywhere on our model. We've even got some kill marks right here. We'll begin with the large roundels that will go on the wings of the aircraft. Now the trickiest part of this is to make sure that everything is symmetrical. In other words, anything that goes on one side of the model probably needs to go on the other side of the model. To help with that, we're again going to use tape to help us cheat. We'll start by cutting the graphic out very close to the edge, but being careful not to cut the graphic itself. And then we'll eyeball things. That looks like a good spot for the marking. It's just a hair below the yellow leading edge and midway between, midway in this white field of the invasion stripe. So what I'm going to do is I will take a piece of six millimeter tape. 
let's check that again. And I'm going to place it right up against the yellow leading edge. That gives me one defined edge there. The other can be the middle of this field. I can even cheat with tape there. I'll take another piece of this six millimeter tape and place it in the far interior field of the invasion stripe. Now let's eyeball this again. So if when we apply this, we line up these two points, we'll get a good positioning of this graphic. This will also be repeatable on the opposite side of the model. Now to apply the graphic, we're going to peel away the backing from the adhesive side of the graphic. We are going to be careful to leave the graphic attached to the top carrier sheet. I like that. I'm going to press that down into place and then I'm going to lift up the transfer layer. Our cheap strips of tape can come up. There we go. Our first marking is in place. We'll repeat the process on the other side. The rest of the markings will all be applied at very high speed. As I apply them, take note of all the little alignment tricks I use to make sure that we maintain symmetry on both sides of the model. Dry transfer application is now complete. I'll go back and add a motor retainer and a shock cord and the rocket will be ready to fly. The classic Gulf racing livery dating back to the 60s has always been a favorite of mine, so this presentation seemed like a great opportunity to try something very similar. This is yet another Big Red Max kit bashed into a 307% interpretation of yet another 60s classic, the Estes Alpha. The fins are again sourced from Mike Nowak at Galactic Manufacturing and are laser cut from 8th inch thick plywood. I've skinned over that with 64th inch thick plywood for ease of finishing. It also adds a bit of strength. An 8 inch stretch has been added to the airframe and the nose cone was taken from an Estes doorknob. The model has already been primed with Rust-Oleum Auto Primer and I'm about to step outside off camera to sand it down. Let's talk about the paint job for our Alpha. Now this will be a much simpler paint job than what we just did for the Spitfire, but it will be no less dramatic. Our first step will be to paint the upper surfaces with a light blue color. We'll then put some masking in place and spray the lower surfaces with a bright orange. Very simple. Let's get started. The blue goes on the model using the same technique we've used throughout this video. Long strokes, beginning off the model and finishing off the model. Painting the light blue on our model we use up a full two cans of the Tamiya spray lacquer. You might also notice that the nose cone is not on here. We're going to paint the nose cone a different color. 
the bottom half of our model, that's this half, is going to receive the contrasting orange paint now. We'll need to mask for that. And we'll do that by placing two strips of tape down the length of the airframe tube. To help keep that tape straight, we're going to use this. This is an old Great Plains Easy Touch bar sander. It doesn't have any sandpaper on it at this point. I use this primarily for marking, believe it or not. Unfortunately, it's not currently available. There are similar products available out there on the market. You could go to a metal supplier and just get a, a simple piece of angle iron or aluminum to do this. We're going to place this up against the side of the model and use it to keep our tape straight as we apply it onto the model. Let's get started. This is a three-handed operation, but you can see how the sanding bar is used as a visual guide to align the tape along the airframe tube. We then slit the tape to separate the payload section as we're going to paint that separately. Be sure to mask off the coupler as part of this process. We can then attach overspray masks with cheap tape on both the payload section and the booster section. This plastic sheeting was cut from a kitchen trash bag. Back in our palatial pro-grade paint booth, we can start applying the orange spray lacquer. Same process as before with long strokes that start off of the model and end off of the model. Our paint has had the opportunity to cure overnight, so we can begin unmasking. We are on the home stretch now. We've got just a little bit more to do. Our next step is to apply a cheat line. Now, what is a cheat line? A cheat line is an aviation term. It, it refers to a long, thin line applied to an aircraft, usually a commercial aircraft, that's designed to cheat the eye to make the aircraft appear more streamlined. This is some half inch wide black Mylar tape that I found on Amazon for about $12 a roll. Not only can you use Mylar tape to retain rocket motors in rockets, you can also use it to decorate them. It's also a dessert topping. We are going to bring out our trusty bar sander again and use it to line up the Mylar as we apply it. This is going to be another tricky three-handed operation. I might get in the way of the camera, but I'll try not to. Some neat vinyl golf decals were located on Amazon and they're perfect for our rocket. Note that we're using the same alignment techniques that we used earlier for our Spitfire. Finally, our nose cone was painted black to add some tire color to the automotive theme. Here's a final look at our completed rockets. While these techniques do take some time and require a bit of patience, nothing we've done here is difficult. Just about any builder with a few projects worth of experience should be able to do something just as cool. Finally, keep in mind that these techniques easily scale down to the tiniest model rockets or up to monster high power projects. Thanks for watching. 